shoots the puck so hard, you're, you're kind of scared when you're out there. We all know where the puck's going. Look up and see where it is in the game. The master deal look like I'm in the shooting game, but I'm really not. <laughs> Always shoots at this high, too, where he ankles. Yeah. That's not good. You just don't want to get in front of that. The ice bags everywhere after that game. It's not pretty. <laughs> I just liked shooting when I was younger. My dad just, he worked at a sawmill. He brought a piece of plywood home for me to shoot off of. I would just come home after school and shoot pucks. You know, put cans up, tie cans up and shoot at those. And it was just something I loved doing. You're running a power play practice and you're hopeful that nobody gets in the way of it. You can't even shoot as hard as he wants. Unfortunately, hit a couple teammates before that have, uh, you know, gotten injured or broken bones. Gonna hurt the goalie. It's uh, something I'm aware of and try not to get after it too much in practice. He just missed the net and the puck went right to the boards. Went viral. It was, uh, it was crazy. You don't even know what to think at that point. It's scary hard. Because it goes so fast, you can't see it. You don't know where it's going. Goalies are mainly just getting in front of it. He doesn't even need a screen to score. Puck went in just as fast as it came out. Jay Weber is out there just wrecking Arizona Coyotes. Over to Weber at last. Oh my. Did it go through the net? Did it tear off the top of the crossbar? Oh, McDonald didn't move. Jay Weber hammers one home. Maybe the heaviest shot in the league. That is fantastic stuff. October 11, 2014. Travis Hamanick is on his way to work. It's the New York Islanders' home opener. And the Nassau Coliseum is sold out. At 24, Hamanick is widely considered one of the best young defensemen in hockey. Tonight, just as at every home game, there is a young fan in the stands, a guest of Hamannick's he's never met. He and Hamannick share a bond they wish they didn't. Hockey for me was just always my escape. I wasn't much of a talker when I was younger. I didn't like to talk about my emotions. But I do for a greater cause now. This was all, all yours. Yeah, all this, this whole area in the back here. This could have been where you ended up. Yeah, it very well could have. Travis Hamannick grew up here in Saint Malo, Manitoba, a small farming community on the Canadian Plains. Along with his mother and three older siblings, he would work the wheat fields with his father, Jerry. Hi! Hi, Daddy! Can I go for a ride? Can I go for a ride? Can I go for a ride with Can I go for a ride? Can I go for a ride? Okay, farmer of the hour, how is everything going out here? <laughs> Just starting now. I was pretty, like, idyllic farm kind of childhood. My dad would get up super early and come home late or come home for lunch, really dirty. But Travis's father always made time for his family. Happy Father's Day to you! Yeah. Wait, Travis is getting in there. Oh, he's coming! There. That's our little brother! He's my superhero. 
He was someone that I felt more safe with in this world than, than anyone else can ever imagine. Say hi to mommy. Hi. What's he doing? Hey, with daddy? You love daddy? As he started to play a bit more sports, Jerry just bonded deeply with Travis. They connected really early, and that connection stayed strong, really strong. That connection was forged on the ice, and especially in the St. Malo rink. So, what else? What do you got on your feet there? Let's see. Red skates. When did you guys? realized that Travis had a certain aptitude for the game. He must have been about five years old. I was going to the rink, he was playing with the eight, nine-year-olds, and I heard, go Travis! The crowd is screaming, and I see this little kid weaving up with the puck. My dad loved taking him to the rink in the morning, and so I think there's that special bond between them around this great game. I just think he really loved watching his son do whatever I was gonna do, whether it was hockey or being on the farm. I just think he really was proud of, of me. September 15, 2000, Travis is 10 years old. His father is bringing in the wheat harvest. It was a normal night. He came home and uh, he had been combining. He, we were all together and the kids went to bed. Good night. Good night. I remember waking up to my sister Melissa um, yelling at me basically to get up and, and trying to tell me what was going on. And uh, I remember rushing out of my room and at that point, um, my dad was getting stretched out. He's getting stretched out, and the last thing he did was uh, <clears throat> he couldn't talk at that point. Uh, he just held out his hand, and I remember just grabbing it as they wheeled him away. That was it. It's the last memory I have. Travis's father had suffered a massive heart attack. He died at the hospital that night. He was 44. You're 10 years old, you're still trying to comprehend what's, what's going on, what's not going on. Is this real, is this not real? I mean, you're in shock. Just days after his father's death, Travis and his mother went driving through their wheat fields, confronting the reality of life without him. Me and Jesse went through that field last time we were on the farm with Dad. Yeah. Our wheat's not all done. Oh, you're right. It's Terrifying. Life stopped as we knew it. Devastation. With their father gone, Travis and his brother Jesse would bring in the harvest for one last time. Good job, Travis. That's dad's boy. And he's gonna pray for us. I want you guys to remember that. The following year, Travis's mother sold the farm. In 2003, when he was 13, Travis and his mother moved to Winnipeg, where she would work as a nurse. It was there that Travis emerged as one of the most promising young players in the region. I really didn't talk much about my dad's death. I didn't open up to anyone about it. 
I was able to, to really just get away from the world and shut everyone out. But he's with me every day. Absolutely crushed by Travis Hammond. I... When he was 17, the New York Islanders selected Hammonick in the second round of the NHL draft. Then, on November 24, 2010, when he was playing for the Islanders farm team in Connecticut, I looked at my phone and I saw six calls come in and I knew something had happened. And I called him and he says, Mom, they called me up. Dad would be so proud. Dad would be so proud of this. Your son is like nailing it on his dream like he did it. I just can't imagine how that moment would have been for my dad. You know, I don't even know if words can describe. Defenseman number three, Travis Hammond. It was an unbelievable defining moment in our family. Hemenick made an immediate impact, never looking back except in one way. The last thing I do before any game is, is I look up to the left corner of the rink and ask God to, to let my dad be watching. I would trade in every game that I've ever played and ever will play in the NHL just for one shift of him being able to watch me play and, and for me to be able to talk to him after the game about it. And so three years ago, Hamannick approached the Islanders with an idea. I wish I would have had any sort of guidance at some point in my life of how to deal with it. I really had to start, you know, reevaluating what was going on and, and how I was handling my grief. I felt being humble and quiet about it was the best way for me to, to get by and the best way to not think about it but it just caused me to think about it more and more. I couldn't block it out any longer. After every Islanders home game, win or lose, Hamnick meets with children who, like him, have lost a parent. It's a lot of sharing. It's a lot of opening up to a lot of people you don't know. It's a sense where you can kind of help each other out. Kevin, what's going on, buddy? Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you, Mr. Hamannick. And nice to meet you. Uh, you can call me Travis. Mr. Hamannick was my dad. Okay. You want me to sign that for you? Yeah. Yeah? You have fun tonight? Yeah. Yeah. I think you're a good luck charm. You guys want to come check out the room? Sure. Yeah. Go for a little tour. Come on. Do you play any sports? This is our room here. I don't know if you know my story. I'm sure you guys are aware or not. Uh, uh, when I was 10 years old, my, my dad passed away uh, of a heart attack. I'm not going to lecture you guys at all in grief, and everyone has their own way of dealing with it. Well, the biggest thing that I'll say from, from dealing with it, it it's normal, whatever you're going to go through. It's a really wonderful thing you do for the kids. I just yeah. want to thank you. Unfortunately. We're part of a club. I meet all sorts of kids coming through. Realize that you're not in it alone. I score for you. And I like seeing hockey games in real life. It's a, it's a, it's it's a very rare experience for me. Eleven-year-old Jerry Horning never knew his father, who died from a brain aneurysm in 2002 when Jerry's mother was pregnant. I was surprised because I lost my dad too. We Travis, that was my favorite part. He was like meeting like a brother. If I hadn't had outside help from Travis, I don't know, I probably wouldn't be here. Like Travis, Thomas Callahan was 10 when he lost his father five years ago to a stroke. I was thinking for the worst. 
I really just had no idea what I was going to do. And I felt like my world was coming to an end. It was hard for him to tell me he was in pain and hard for him to tell me he needed some help. But he reached out to Travis. A lot of these kids I see, some of them are lost and some of them don't know which way to go. I see myself in a lot of them. This is, uh, this is my email. And if you ever need to talk, you ever need to vent, you ever... Try to let them know that, that the sun will come out the next day and, and it will get better. For years, Hamannick kept his grief locked away, bottled up. Now, by giving voice to it, he's given hope to others. And he's given himself a chance, at last, to heal. They always think that, that I'm helping them, but they really are helping me. Every time I talk, it gives me a little bit more closure and a little bit more satisfaction personally that I am getting through it. This is the night it all started, the first standing ovation, the first cheers of his name. The coining of King Henrik, now a Vesna winner, the backbone of a Stanley Cup contender on North America's grandest stage. I, I know how much you love the word star. <laughs> so what's it like to be a star here in New York City? Uh, First of all, hockey isn't that big in the U.S. We have a lot of fans in New York, but the thing with New York, though, there's so many people that come in here, they're tourists. Uh, they don't know what's going on in the city. So if you run into 10 people here, I would say five are tourists. Mm -hmm. Three people don't follow hockey. Mm -hmm. So maybe two out of 10 know who you are. Mm -hmm. That's it, tops. The organization, first of all, it's class. <laughs> That's one, one on 15 now. <laughs> Lundquist rolls his eyes at the word star, but that's what he is, and other beloved New York athletes know it. He's huge. You know, uh, he's the backbone to the, to the Rangers. You know, everything had to pass through him. Uh, as he go, the success of the Rangers go. Always impeccably dressed, heavily involved in the team's Garden of Dreams charity, jamming with good friend John McEnroe, co-owner of the restaurant Tiny's and the bar upstairs. Hockey will always be number one, no question. It, it will be your focus, but I always need something to kind of, something that takes my mind of hockey. Thank you, the NHL, for ending your lockout. And thank you, New York Rangers goalie Henrik Lundqvist for celebrating by coming on our show and playing Sweet Child of Mine on the guitar. What doesn't this guy have I don't have think, yeah, I mean, it's annoying, it is. <laughs> The guy's so damn good looking, and uh, he's sort of that GQ guy. But, you know, he's, he's humble about it. He's got a humility. What you see is what you get, in a way. You just don't see the, the degrees of, of what you're seeing. You don't see how intense he is or how dedicated he is or how long it takes him to comb his hair. <laughs> <laughs> how long does it take him to comb I'm his hair? I'm thinking a little bit longer than he would admit. <laughs> I always wear a hat when I play tennis. I don't know how much he knows about that, but uh, he, he's a funny guy. He may be friendly and accommodating, but he's also a fierce competitor who cannot stand to lose. McEnroe, very similar, reached out after last season's playoff loss to the Devils, knowing how awful Lundquist would feel. What did you say to him when you reached out to him? You want to go jam? 
<laughs> yeah, let's go play guitar and not think about this. I'm an intense guy and he probably sees that and, and it's probably something that has given me a lot of inspiration over the years to try to get better and, and try to win. You um, have worked very hard to control your temper over the years. Is there a favorite Henrik Lundqvist temper tantrum story that you that you tell? <laughs> well, there's a few locker rooms around the league that have, you know, holes in the wall or, or, or in the bench. Do you visualize yourself holding the Stanley Cup? Oh, yeah. How often? Um... I don't know how often, but it, it happens. You can ask Messier uh, when they won the Stanley Cup uh, how the city will put you on the top and just keep you there. I know that there's an emptiness, uh, and it, you know, a lot of players don't deserve that, uh, and they feel unfulfilled. In and I'm definitely pulling for them big time. I mean, I think it's finally you know this next couple years is uh, it's time to do it. I always been a big dreamer, and, and, and you know, I set goals, but I also see myself down the road to, to accomplish things that, um, you know, I've been dreaming about for a long time.